Boa. Perfect. Calma, deixa eu ver se aparece mais. Mas não acredito, não é? Não é assim. Mas por que tu dá tão mais chifras do que eu para... Isto é a nossa ferramenta, este é o nosso trabalho. Ah, já temos pois, aqui, olha, tira as pontas para... e tira as pontinhas. Eu acho que não tem nada teu já aqui. Tu fizeste sair de tudo. Pronto. Então, se eu pedir aqui alguma das tuas contas, só para não pedir para essa coisa, portanto, não tem nada Tá, estou já. Vou lá. Tá bem. Ok, yes.
Sim. Olá, boa tarde. Desculpa que ainda não tinha vindo aqui em geração. Eu não sei se aqui está tudo ok. Penso que sim. Então, estamos aqui a preparar, depois vamos começar já daqui a 15 minutos, mais ou menos.
Portanto, eles dizem que a apresentar a caixa de futebol, que ainda não fiz, com todos os conhecidos. Sim. Mas acima de tudo ficar atento aos Facebooks e aos X, a ser velho, os custos justos, ver se alguém tenta vender aquilo. É aqui, uma coisa que nós vamos aí? Hã? É aqui. E a transmissão tem que ser do. Está aqui. Já está, aliás, já está no ar uh, no YouTube. Ai, já está. Catarina, ai Jesus, stress. Sim? Sim. Sim. Aqui em cima. Uh, queres que eu lance já? Na nuvem. Ok. Recording in progress. Já está. Já foi acabar. Ok, só não lancei foi o webinar. Fiquei a guardar que a malta chega. Já a turma ainda está mal estado. Hum. Muda a câmera. Bem, não ias desligar outra vez a extensão. Really? fizeram umas perguntas para fazer perguntas, tens que vir, tens que gravar, põe a gravar. É sobre o quê? Uh, Ui, isto é de veras interessante. Ui, deve ser muito bem. Oh, vá lá. Olha, de manhã. Que lindo, eu vim aqui. Mas a gente não vai falar de tudo. Isto é o bar, é como é que se é o bar oceânico, como é que se chama muito o bar oceânico. Ali é o bar interno, isto aqui é a família, isto é um espaço muito correto. Eu tenho um colega meu que vem aí com a família, agora até dia 13, ia ficar aqui e hoje tentar aterrar duas vezes e não consegui. Aqui? E foi para São Miguel. Pois é. Está muito vento. Foi. Muito vento. Vento aqui. Oh, oh, olha nas lojas. Estava na praia, talvez. Estava muito, muito vento, muito, muito vento. Estou a tentar aterrar. É isso. Dois, um, dois, dez, dez da manhã. Ah. E foram para São Miguel. Mas hoje? Já hoje mesmo? Hoje, hoje mesmo. Ah, Aterraram a São Miguel e ainda ficaram bem. Assim, é, tecnicamente. Duas horas. Isto é talvez o pior, então. Isto é para baixo. Já que estamos várias vezes também. É o pior. É porque, então o auditório é para mais. Pois há este tempo. Mas e lá abaixo também. Ok, isso é lá abaixo. Uh, eu deixei as minhas coisas porque eu assim vou trabalhar. E quando se acontecer aqui vou trabalhar, portanto eu trouxe tudo. Vou deixar aí, posso? Pronto, só
wow. Okay, so just uh, please take a seat. The, okay. the gentleman <laughs> should be here in a minute. I like those curtains. Beautiful. So this is good. Não se quer vai ligar o outro, não é? Ok, o que quiser, mas... A Catarina também está a falar com ele. Agora tem que se ligar. Não, seja o qual for. Agora a questão que se coloca aqui é... A Nice Review. Para se fazer o mesmo modelo, quem faz a apresentação tem aqui em frente. Sim, não é isso. Não. Sim. 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 Has Katrina started this? Or? Yes, yes, you already. Okay. I already started the, the webinar, so. just now with Dr. Julio Hoffman. Dr. Julio has more than 10 years of experience in advanced statistical theories uh, for geoscience. He is creator and lead developer of the geostats.jl project, as well as various other open source projects that are widely used by the geoscientists uh, around the world. Julio? Thank you. Thank you, John. So uh, I would like to get everyone to actually hands-on here, so that's going to be really like, I expect you to actually follow things with exercises, so if you have the time and if you didn't do it already, uh, you have the main event uh, repository, but you can also go to this one alternatively if you didn't download the data set yet, but please do this and launch Docker, which was the suggested uh, method to get the uh, notebooks working, right, so 
I'll just wait everyone to raise the hand when uh, when you're ready, right? So the idea is that we're gonna launch Docker, and inside Docker we're gonna launch Bluetooth, and I'll show how to do that. And then after you launch Bluetooth, you're gonna start this specific notebook called Geodata Science Dash Docker. That's the simplified like one, where I hope everyone is gonna be able to follow step by step. So. The way you would start Docker depends on your operating system, right? So we saw uh, Gail explain this uh, today, uh, this morning. So I'm assuming that you already have the Docker launched and you are able to launch either the Julia repo or Pluto or Jupyter. And please raise your hand if you are not there yet. Is, is everyone ready to... I'm not there, but I will try to okay. Get there. Yeah. okay, just go for it. Uh, yeah. uh, is geodatascience.gl the same as geodatascience.gl? So this one is heavier. If you have more uh, powerful hardware, you can try this one, but you have Mac visualizations. So Mac is a bit heavier. So I did the dash docker one is the safer one that I think everyone will just use easily. The, without the docker suffix, it's going to be heavier. So I would say start with the docker one. And if you have later time, like later today or over the week, you try the, the one without the dash docker because it has Mackie visualizations, which are heavier. Yeah. Just as a reminder, uh, the sessions are being recorded and are going to remain available on YouTube. So if you can't do any things now, just it, it's okay. You, you can take your time later. And sometimes it's even easier. You take your time, you go yeah. at your own place. The notebooks uh, are on the Git repo, uh, ours and Julius, and uh, the video will be on our YouTube channel. Perfect. Thank you, John. So I'll just continue in small steps, and I'll show some slides here while you guys are preparing so that we have something going on, right? But the idea is that you start Docker, or if you already have Julia in your machine, and especially if you have Julia 1.8, or even if you are in the bleeding edge 1.9 beta, I tested the notebooks on these two versions, so you'll be fine. But assuming that you have Docker already launched, you then go to, I don't know why it's not sharing, but let me see if I can come back to the other screen. Okay, so if you launch Docker, you will be able to press the box that has Pluto in it, and you should see this window, which is the welcome window for Pluto, right? Uh, if you're not there yet, just hang on. And after you launch Pluto, there will be this uh, small uh, browser here at the bottom, and this browser here will have the data sets and the notebooks that we are currently investigating, right? So if you follow the exact command I shared here with Docker, you will be able to access this folder inside the Docker image because that's just downloading this repository, unzipping it, putting it anywhere in your machine, and then running Docker with this command should allow you to access the data sets from the Docker image. Or if you're not willing to use Docker, just launch Julia, unzip this repository, and launch Julia in that, in that folder. It's gonna be the same effect. The Docker is just to make things more smooth for everyone, right? But so, having Pluto launched, I'll just uh, do this here. You choose the geodata science slash docker.jl notebook, and then you press open or enter in your machine. Here I'll launch the, the normal one because I, I want to launch the one that's heavier, but I think it's safe if, if you use the one with dash docker. So I will just press enter, and that's going to initialize the the first notebook, that's going to be the majority of the work that you're going to do this session here. There will be a second notebook which uh, can be useful for, for you too, but it's going to be run on the Julia beta version. I, I think it's better. You can also run on Julia 1.8. It's fine. It's going to take more time just to load. It's uh, very heavy. The second one has many advanced uh, 3D examples which will take time to, to load. So here you see the, the first uh, notebook loading. How many of you got the notebook launching or is it? Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. So you should see this panel first and then after two minutes or so you should see the table of contents showing up here because it's loading everything behind the scenes. I'll actually use my 
But we agree that there is no notebook in the zip file you download from GitHub, right? So there is Geostats so, folder. Yeah, there's a Geostats folder. Yeah, but there's no notebook, right? Can I look at it? So when you when you downloaded the repository, the, the repository folder has all notebooks and a data subfolder. It has everything you need, just one repository has everything. It's not in the, which one is it? It's not in... Uh, in the Docker image, you mean? No, 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 I'm saying this. It's, it's not in the hands-on sessions, it's in hands-on geostats. Yes, hands-on geostats. In the repository of the event, there's a subfolder called hands-on geostats and it, everything you need is there. Let me also put a timer here so that we don't lose track of time. <laughs> So initiate it. So you'll see that this will take some time to load. Let me go back to the slides so that you understand what the project is and so we get going. So what is uh, this workshop about? This workshop will talk about two things, geodata science and geostatistical learning, which are concepts that are pretty much the equivalent of non-geospatial data science and machine learning, but in the geospatial context. And what we'll do here is like two notebooks, the one the first one I would like to try to follow with you guys step by step, which contains the basic ingredients that if you get familiar with these ingredients, you can do more advanced stuff by your own. And the second notebook is more for like following what is possible, showing what is possible and seeing what you can do with your own research and data sets. So short intro, I think I'll just skip this because Joan mentioned. I'm the author of this uh, framework. Uh, I'm currently the, the CEO of this company, Arpeggio. And I did my PhD in geostatistics. This work has been, uh, this geostats framework has been developed over years. And I'm really into this field. I've been doing uh, research on this area for many, many years. And I would like to basically put the sugar for everyone that's not inside of this field to learn how to use these things correctly, let's say. When correctly here is read with double quotes, right? But you can find more information on my website. So what is geostats.jl? Geostats.jl is a general framework for geospatial data analysis and modeling. And it's a growing scientific community. As you see, there are many publications coming out using the, the framework already. I will just touch some of them. And it's fully written in Julia. So if you're seeing some of the efforts in the Julia community, this one is one that's purely written in Julia. We, we, we got this decision, this design decision of not depending on external libraries. And it's for maximum flexibility, right? So we want our users to become contributors and become active developers of the framework. There is a documentation and there is a, a forum where you can ask and interact with the community. And it's currently a very comprehensive, I would say, like software stack. There are missing ingredients still, but it's made of several packages, this framework, right? So it's a all batteries included concept. You load one package and you get everything on your session. And it's designed for people who are really interested in advanced geometric processing. So if you go to 3D geometric processing, or if you want to do more complicated geometric operations, we have this sub-module called Meshes, which is done in the geometric processing part. It's uh, state-of-the-art geostatistics. It has uh, many solvers that are not easy to implement, but it's already available there. And it also has two options for visualization. Right? So there is. Geostats Viz is the stack of visualization with Maki.jl, which is the more powerful interactive 3D system. And we have the old recipe system, Geostats Plots, for the plots uh, stack of visualization. There are other auxiliary packages to get things uh, loaded, but these are the main submodules, let's say, for point pattern analysis, interpolation, and all kinds of things. They are in these sub packages. Where it has been used, so it's been used by uh, consulting groups, research institutes, companies. We've been able to use this uh, open source tech for commercial solutions as well. So there are companies that are using, and researchers inside of companies that are using this uh, stack, as well as smaller groups and people who are using it for consulting. Scientific publications that I think overlap with the Air Center theme. So we had uh, people, I don't know who these are, so that's nice, right? We have a community that's made of people who are not from our circle. So these people published work on Asner and others 
on mapping rugosity of coral reefs. They say that the reef rugosity is a measure of complexity, of 3D complexity, that's important to monitor the impact of human activities in Hawaii, for example. They got all the islands of Hawaii uh, and computed these rugosity maps, which are basically <laughs> variograms computed on these data sets. And that was a very interesting work that I never thought of uh, by when I, write, when I wrote the software at the beginning. So that was really nice. These are more recent publications of this year by people who are studying uh, Gaussian processes and simulations of distributions in space, right? So this is work in the mining industry, this is work in material structure, and they use some of the modules or for, for doing this analysis or visualization. That was really nice to see too. And I hope that at some point we will be interacting here more to get more publications out of the Air Center and people here. So hopefully you see your papers coming up with this deck as well. So what's the plan for today? We have an agenda that's made of these uh, sections. This 10 minutes of slides is what I'm doing right now. I'm planning to just wait you guys to get set up with the notebooks and then we'll switch to the first session of the hands-on, which is going to be the geodata science part. <coughs> then a coffee break or something short to answer questions that will be available here. And then switch to a second notebook, which is heavier, but it's, uh, it shows a lot of the, the stuff that can be done already with this framework. So just to ask again before continuing, uh, is everyone following? How many of you got the first notebook loaded and Okay, not yet. repeat where the first notebook yeah. was located? I want to go to the uh, Inside the... It should, it should be... I just close that, I think, so... Uh, in half, in the the doctor will be yeah. If you want to try in your local machine, you have a power form. If you want to try on local Julia, that would be an option too. Because you have the data downloader, right? Yes. You need to call Douglas after that file. You should have the docker inside there. I think the best is to use yeah. the yeah. 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 to go inside of this one. Yeah, this is the folder that you want to. Yeah. This one? Yeah. So you can either load Docker and then map this folder on Docker, or you can style Julia and load Julia in this folder. So do you want. Help with any of those options? Yeah, so, yeah, what's the dollar? This command, what he showed, and uh, this is just the current working reference, and I run this just yeah. to the audio. Yeah. But you, you need to be able to access that folder, so that, that's all. You have to yes. run that mount. So, so I'm, since I'm already in the folder with this one? Yeah. yeah, you can do the Docker run here. So how did you start the, the, It was through Docker? Uh, still the game, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I closed it and did again. Uh, sure uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, what you put yeah. on this file stuff. That, that will work. Uh, it's mostly that yeah, the, 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 the Docker image has some Inside sort of, of stuff. Inside of Google, you copy the path, right? Uh, yeah. And well, you have to adjust the path to the next so one. Yeah, yeah, so but the, the notebook no, is the same. same yeah, 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 I have to, uh, do you want to try to do the no, so that should work. It'll take a while. Again, it'll take a while. Uh, 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 you download the better one, yep. you, can, you can get even better results. Like you can download the stable too, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Why did you guys try just using Pluto and then Pluto rocket in type of yeah. direction and yeah, then go back? Yeah, it was for me. It's just for me. It's for me. It's for me. Which part is the other one? Oh, really? Yeah, I think it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Already is not running out of the other one. Would you like to try the alternative path with like using Judy directly on the machine? I think it's easier to use Judy directly on the machine. With Pluto, it's just one line of installation. So package add Pluto and it's down in Judy. It's very quick. I think it's saner because the Docker works when it works, but it's such a heavy hammer force just getting this to work. So if you want to go, the alternative path would be to go to the julialeng.org website, download Julia 1.8 or 1.9 beta, and then install it. It can be with 1.8, the last stable is 1.8. It can also do... I didn't test with 1.7, but if you want to try it. I I use 1.8, 1.8 works. Okay. Yeah. You got it running. You got it running. Nice. I haven't tried the one with stats, though. But. Yeah. So just uh, for the sake of time, let's say, let's see how it's going here. Stalling. Stalling. I, I didn't use Docker. You didn't use Docker? I didn't use Docker. Uh, I think it's just easier to do it without Docker because eventually people are not going to use Docker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Okay. So uh, I noticed that my problem is the folder. I have to change my directory. The folder, yes. So it's the problem up here. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I changed the directory to the folder. Yes. Okay. But this is what I already have to work on. Oh, yeah, yeah, like you said, it will take a while. Not I'm not sure what the works are all doing. Also, you can power shell. And then when we were talking, it's that same code where we were talking. It was very nice. Yeah. You're talking so I think everyone can see. You're using Utah. So it's the same. But what's the... So I have to do this. Docker wasn't supposed to be used for that. It's the same problem, yeah. I just refresh. Oh, by the way, I What are you presenting tomorrow? Some Oh, cool. And then, together with Felix, go to. No, actually, this one. Before. Uh, he's not a business or 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 a Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Well, SAR is definitely a really, uh, especially in SAR, of course. We have, we are going to showcase uh, the SAR. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, it's not, it's not uh, launch. Yeah. Wait, you're going to do a whole in SAR uh, pipeline yourself in Julia, in Italy? Yes. Wow. Well, we have so far as we have it. We're it's hacked. So it works. With <laughs> one and Sorry, those two one goes this. Yes. 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 But it doesn't work like in like like different yeah. way. Yeah. And there's a lot of uh, that, that other stuff. <laughs> there's a lot of hate. <laughs> um, <laughs> just hate. Good idea. Just the open file. Let's open the session. And so after it's installed, we can just say using Pluto. Use Pluto.prem. Okay. okay. And then you can choose the yeah. 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 space. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. 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 the second line will be ready. Oh, yeah. 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 actually, now I was going to support Christ. Just yeah. 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 And looking at this actually, I think it really works better than most other installations that work. Yeah, just add the original command from the. We can just copy Or is it just a. No notebooks, but you don't have any dogs. Oh, just have them so far. As opposed to the. Yeah, so people could run it in Docker if they don't have a choice. Yeah. So they can choose to it. Yeah. Just as here. Yeah. Just as here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, it depends yeah. on like that. Although it's like annoying to get from one to go, but I think it's better to have it than less. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 I don't know, maybe. Yeah. You guys got something working already? Yeah, yeah. Shut yeah. the notebooks. Yeah. Uh, Geo Data Science Dash Docker. This one? Yeah. You are with Julia locally, right? Yeah. Nice. 1.7 or 1.7 or if it's going to give you issues, but I just don't want to pay it and it works. So let me get back to the agenda then. Uh, and then Pluto dot run. Open parentheses, close parentheses, and Oh, and oh, this is one command using Pluto. Uh, you're going to the dark. Ah, sorry. No, we just five. Okay. And then close five steps. No, you can type. I think it should yeah. it show up at some point. Yeah. So let's see if things are still working as expected. So I'm assuming that most of you got the got the notebook launch. We can stop again to see this, but let me restart the timer. And let's go with this first session of the hands-on, right? So this module here. Hey guys, let's let's start the first session. Let's see. Everyone is everyone is with the notebook loaded already? Cool. Yeah, you're still waiting, right? So, in this first notebook here, what we'll do is cover the basics of how you load, uh, let's say, how do you represent geospatial data uh, in this framework and how you do processing. So, basically, how you create data pipelines to take one geospatial data set and convert into another, right? So, the main objectives of this section are to introduce these fundamental concepts of geospatial data. And when I say here, learn the right way, I, I mean, take it, like, uh, interpret the way you want. Like, what I mean is, I've been developing this package over years, and I think I got a way that's kind of efficient to, proficient to work. Like, so if you, you follow this uh, simple recipes, I guess, you can get very complicated pipelines quickly uh, with your geospatial data sets. Um, and then to practice some of these tools, right, and then we will see how this, can easily escalate to something very comp very complex. So you can build very complicated pipelines uh, if you learn these basics here. So what is geospatial data set? Geospatial data, so we, in, in our framework, we, we understand geospatial data by the combination of two things. There is this abstraction of a table, which is something that looks like a table, right? So you feel that there's columns that are named, which represent variables in your problem. And there is a geospatial domain. So these two together, they form what we call a geospatial data set. And we, it's, strictly speaking, this is a discrete data set. So we have a discretization of a geospatial domain. Right? So we have a mesh, a grid of cells, or a point set. These are like innumerable set of geometries. So you have first, second, third, and the nth geometry. This is the domain, plus a table with n rows. And so the, the way we abstract this out is by this single function, is the function GeoRef, which takes a table and a domain and constructs a geospatial data set, right? So this function goes one way, where you take any table, say a, a, a CSV file or a raster uh, array that uh, Raf showed in the presentation there, it's also a table as he presented, and then you map it to a domain. The domain has uh, many types of domains which are coming from the match.jl package. And then you can do the other way as well, which is given a geospatial data set, you can recover the table and the domain using the functions values and domain, right? So the basic example here is, for example, assume that you have a data frame, which is just like a data set with two variables, A and B. And you would like to map this data frame into a geospatial system, right? So you can for example, do GeoRef the table on a set of random points. For example, that would be one possibility, right? Where you can now see that there are two variables, A and B, and there's a special column that's always gonna be called geometry, which contains the points or the quadrangles or the triangles or any kind of sophisticated geometry that you encounter in GIS uh, solutions, right? So here's a simple example where we map these two variables to a random set of points. 
but you could also map this to any set of geometry. You'll see more of that in, in the following sections here, right? So, for example, if I map this table to this random set of points, I get a point data, data set that I'm saving this variable point data. And one of the things that we are building here is to hiding a lot of the complexity on how do you plot and how do you process this and interpret this data as if it was a table, right? Although it's not a table, you can, for example, feed this point data into, I'm calling here in my notebook a viewer, but in your notebook, if you loaded the dot dash docker one, it's going to be a plot command. And the plot will show the data with the plots.jl stack, and the viewer will show the data with the Mackie.jl stack, right? So this viewer here for me is interactive. For you, it's not, right? But uh, you can load, you have this access to the other notebook as well. So you can zoom in, zoom out, and you can see this menu here at the top, which will show you all the variables of this data set so that you can quickly navigate your geospatial data set. The idea is that this viewer will be improved over years, and, and the, the viewer itself is trying to do some smart things here, like choosing the color scheme for you, depending on the nature of the variable. It's trying to automate some of the things that you, you usually have to do anyways, right? Can you zoom in a bit? I think it's also good for the video. Zoom the full notebook? No, just, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much white space. Cool. What about now? So now that we have this uh, data loaded, right, so we can do the same, but let's say I want to reference it to a raster, let's say to a grid, whatever name you use to represent a grid of cells or geometries. That's the same thing, you use the same GeoRef command where you have a set of variables and you map it to, say, a Cartesian grid, right? So I'm saying there are 10 by 10 cells, which are, when you say here like this, you can actually get instant uh, documentation by pressing the live docs here at the right bottom and it will show you how to construct the Cartesian grid, right? So there are many types of constructors and the one I use here is just saying, okay, it's a 10 by 10, I don't know what, where the origin is, where the spacing is, but it's, there are many ways you can construct the grid. And the way you construct the table is also very flexible, right? So in Julia, although I'm using the data frame here, you can, in Julia, all valid tables are, for example, a equals run 10, B equals run 10. This is also a table. So a tuple of, a named tuple of, sorry, an extra parenthesis. A named tuple of uh, vectors is a table. Sorry. And this one parenthesis here. A named tuple of vector is a table. Also a vector of Name it tuples is a table, right? So if I say a, a equals one, b equals two, and then another tuple, a equals two, b equals three, these are two valid built-in table types in Julia. So you don't need to load any extra package. If you use a vector of name it tuple or a name it tuple of vectors, these are tables. And if you want to use a more custom type of table, a data frame, or a raster type, or any type that implements the tables interface, you can. But after you have this uh, georeference to a grid, you see that whenever I try to send this data set to the viewer, the visualization will automatically detect that this is a Cartesian grid, right? So you can still zoom in, zoom out on this geospatial data set and see the variables in the feature table, right? So the idea here is that we'll be able to quickly operate on different kinds of domains, but agnostic to the type of the domain. So you can load point sets, domains, grids, whatever. The pipeline will be the same. Now that we know how to do this, I would like to ask you to do a little simple exercise, which will just get you with the hands dirty, right? So here I'm just, before I go to this exercise, I'm just showing that you can take this geospatial data set and call the values function to retrieve the original table or the domain function to retrieve the underlying domain, right? So you see that when I did the, the point data here at the top, I georeferenced the point data to a set of random points, right? It was a vector of points, but if I do the call here at the bottom just so that you see, and if I say the domain of my point data it will show a point set, which is a set of random points that's wrapped on this domain, the point set, and it knows that this is a set of points that has specific behaviors, not just a vector of points, it's a domain, right? 
now the, the first exercise here is this uh, Boni data set. So I'm bringing uh, data that is coming from uh, the industries I'm interacting the most, right? But uh, you, you can imagine that this is a data set from climate, agriculture, whatever field you are working on. Um, and this data set here specifically comes as a CSV file. So this is the Boni data set. It's from uh, this group here in this copyright notice, right? And this data set basically has a bunch of mineral grades, which is basically saying it's a 3D uh, subsurface model which has cells that are exahedrons, and each exahedron represents a volume of rock with a given grade, which is like percentage of a mineral. Say, here I have that much percentage of gold, that much percentage of copper, that much percentage. So these are just variables that I'm seeing here in parts per million. Gold, uh, AG, copper, arsenic, and, and so on. And there are other variables here that are the type of the rock, for example, the lithology type we call, and the oxidation of the rock. These are just specific to the, to the problem, right? But the idea with this data set is that you, you basically get the, the GeoRef function uh, and understand what's happening. So if you go to the GeoRef documentation, what I'm asking in this exercise here is that you just georeference this table using the east, north, and RL columns of the table, right? So if you see this data set was already loaded, that's super basic, just make sure that you are running the notebook along with me. So I'll give it like one minute if you are like already doing it, or if you're already done, just raise your hand. I, I don't know, but like we have a little bit of uh, issue with the dependencies. Yeah. We got the notebook started, but it's not showing any. Oh, look, no, mine is showing it's, something it's now. Take it back. I don't have you know the value <laughs> of I know when the speedy comes, it lurks. It works. <laughs> it's called Merce Law. Yeah. You should look here. So. Yeah. I don't hey. have <laughs> no. It's still. Yeah, I guess it's I should have something. I don't know. Yeah, the the I just I just I Should be supposed to be more powerful than mine, I guess. I definitely chose to use the left, the other just kicking off the low end, right? So if it works on mine, it should work on most of you. Can we do it? If you want to try the alternative uh, of running Julia locally, of running Julia directly on your machine, so you go to. Do you think it's an option? Julia Langaro? That's the official website. And then you download 1.8, or if you want, even like bleeding edge 1.9, which is the one that's going to be released soon. Right, so, Windows, you can choose 64 bit. Yeah. And then if you install, I think Alex can show you what to do. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so assuming that uh, you guys did it, should be super simple, right? But I'll do the answer here so that we don't waste too much time if Selena is already. So the answer is to replace this missing here with the solution, right? So the solution is simply GeoRef my CSV onto this columns, right? So there is east, north, and RL columns, which are the coordinates of this data set. So you say east, then north, then RL, and that's just specifying a tuple of columns which contain the coordinates. And if you just hit Shift Enter, you will see that the answer is the right one, right? So this should turn green for you. So the result of this GeoRef operation on the table, as you see, it's repeating the same table, but at the end you'll see a special column here again, the geometry column, which just took the three columns, the east, north, and RL, and created this point type, which is just representing the location as a point, right? 
the nice thing about this object, this geospatial data set type of object, is that it behaves like a data frame, right? So if you are familiar with pandas or in the case of Julia, data frames or JL, you can access the rows and columns as if it was a table, but it does some smart things behind the scenes, right? So if you say, give me the first to the third row, which are samples, and give me all variables, right, as the columns. So it returns here this subtable where you have this quadrangle geometries, as you see. So you, I'm showing here the example with grid data, right? So I got my grid data set, which was georeferenced to a grid. And if I say one to three, it just extracts three quadrangle geometries from the data set. If I say grid data, give me the first row or first cell of the grid, it returns this tuple, which has two features, A and B, and the geometry as a quadrangle, which is a Julia object that has many functions defined. If you say, give me all the rows and the variable A, it's going to return the column as a vector of numbers, right? And if you do this special column geometry, it's going to return the domain. It's, that's a special uh, difference here. So because the Cartesian grid is a lazy object, right, it doesn't store any memory, it knows that if you access the geometry columns, actually it's giving you back the domain as a lazy object. It's not creating a set of quadrangles. If your grid is your, if it's your, your raster is very big, it's just going to return the configuration of the raster. Where's the beginning, where's the end, what's the spacing, and so on, right? And after we have this basic manipulation, which is, okay, I know how to georeference tables into domains, and now I want to do some processing. We go to the idea of geospatial transforms to create these pipelines, and that's where things start to get more advanced, right? So if you, if you know what this uh, idea of pipeline is, it's, uh, it's pretty, uh, uh, let's say, short way of representing uh, data transformations in, in sequence or in parallel, right? So here is... We, we, we call this uh, pipelines from the sub-module called table transforms.jl and there are a couple of pipelines uh, transforms defined but here just so that you understand what's going on the way you cre create pipelines is by designing specific transforms pulling specific transforms from this list of transforms and concatenating them with this operator called two right so if you go to LaTeX you, you press backslash two and then press tab, it converts into the arrow. And this arrow is just saying, take a transformation and make it another transformation in sequence, right? So when you stack this two, it creates what we call a sequential transform or a sequential pipeline, which is independent of the data set you have at your disposal. And then after you have this uh, uh, pipeline defined, you can apply the pipeline to any geospatial data set. If the domain is point set, if it's a grid, if it's a mesh, it will work the same, right? So you, for example, here I georeference the CSV to this raw variable, let's say the raw data set we loaded, and then I can take my raw data set and feed into the pipeline with this operator. This is a generic Julia operator to just feed input into a function, right? So what I mean here is that this pipe object, which is this pipe that I'm defining here. You can call it as a function like this and that's going to be the same thing that I'm, done, I'm doing above or you can just say feed this into the function. That's a Julia syntax to say feed my variable into the next thing. Right? So that's the native Julia way of saying of writing pipelines. Here. So but notice the difference like first we create the pipeline of the two operator which is just constructing new pipelines and applying the pipeline is this different operator, right? So that allows you to create pipelines that are lazy. So you concatenate many, many transformations, and then only at the end you just apply it to the data set you have. So building pipelines, right? So this is a sequence of small exercise so that you get used with the syntax again. So there is this uh, web page here which uh, you can click, and you go to the list of pipe uh, transforms defined. And then the exercise is to basically create the pipe one here, which replaces all missing values by the value zero, and then coerces the types of the variables, geo and lito, to be a multi-class variable. So I will follow this with you, but the idea is that you 
go to the, to the documentation here and find out which are the two transforms that represent these two actions and write the pipeline here. Replace the identity transform by something more complicated. So, still have time. Let me see here. Ah, eu acho que deve ser a parte que você rodou, mas você pode, antes de fazer o put run, ah, já foi, sim, sim. tem problema depois. Ah, ok. É, que é só você mudar de pasta, mas é, a gente consegue fazer do mesmo jeito. Porque a pasta é essa, parece esta, mas não parece os... Uh, Clica num desses arquivos aí qualquer, é, num dos notebooks. A hands-on já está. É, pode ser essa parte também, é, acho que vai ser o mesmo material. Né? Isso, esse que aparece. Pô. Isso. Aí clica no Docker, no de baixo, esse. Aí, não, aí só copia o caminho completo do arquivo e coloca lá no Pluto que ele vai funcionar, eu acho. Okay. É lá no, no, no seu navegador de arquivos. Pois. Aí, não, aí vai lá naquele arquivo, do, no browser mesmo que você estava, no navegador de arquivos. E aí... Isso, aí copia o, o caminho completo para esse arquivo. Ctrl C. Coloca lá no Pluto. E aí, barra, tem que ser o, o caminho para o arquivo, né? Pode, aperta tab para ver se ele vai. Não, acho que você fez alguma coisa, abriu outro. Não sei o que aconteceu. Pois, está muito bom de bola. Copia, ele aparece, copia. ele aparece aqui, às vezes. É, copia, copia aquele, aquele caminho, né? Agora aperta tab. Ele não está mostrando o arquivo, que coisa. É, qual é o barra de... Ah, tá aí, pois. Tá aí, tá isso. Agora, ah, agora apareceu. É, okay. Aí o Docker. O Docker, ok. Aí entra. Ok. Ah, oh, I think okay. now it goes. Let's, let's see. Let's see. Conseguiram fazer o que aí? Sim. Sim? Sim. Sim. Coerce. Coerce, the type, is to change the scientific type from continuous to categorical, so multi-class. So if you look at the hint here, mm -hmm. coerce is the transform you want. So it has docs you need. So if you type coerce in live docs, you see what it does exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it uses the scientific types of JL, scientific types of JL to mm -hmm. represent the data as if it was multi-class, right? Because by default, when you load like floats, integers, and stuff, mm -hmm. it's not categorical. Yeah. So it's going to just use categorical arrays to convert things. So let's see how you still didn't get it here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it crushes or something. <coughs> the Docker one? Uh, yes. Yeah. Can you try it again? Yeah, enter. It's difficult to make uh, okay. it work in all hardware, but it should work. Most of the people there got it already. Right. So it, you said it crashed in when you're trying to do the thing, or it didn't even load? Uh, it loaded, but um, it, I think it disconnected. Um, is this the Docker one? Or is it local Julia? Because I think people there had to try local Julia because the Docker was too slow or something like that. I use the Docker one. If you want to try it, I mean, Rafaela and other people there, they installed Julia. He also got it directly, like, installed Julia locally and launched directly on the machine instead of running Docker and then inside Docker running Julia, right? So if you want to try it, uh, you go to julialang.org, download julia 1.8 or 1.9, and, and I can come back here again to give you... Basically, you install it first, and then you say to me when it's ready, come in. Um, how do you come, how do you do two actions at the same time? How do you concatenate two transforms? Yeah. 
backslash to, backslash to, and tab. It creates that arrow operator. Ah, uh, yeah. Mm. So I'll just do it here so that you see. So the first transform is replacing missing values, right? So there's this operation in data science called coalesce, or in stats in machine learning, right? So you say coalesce. This is the transform. And if you open the live docs here, you see that it asks for what's the value that you want to replace the missing by, right? So you say replace missing values from the table with this value. You can also specify specific columns or a re regular expression to choose columns to do this operation, right? But here is, for example, coalesce with the value zero. So I'll say coalesce with the value equals to zero, and it creates my first step of the transform of the pipeline. And now the second thing I want to do is to change the scientific type of the columns geo and little to categorical or multi-class, right? So you say backslash two, and then you say coerce, and then you can see here that the notation is give me a, a, a set of pairs for doing the conversion, right? So it gives examples here at the bottom. So coerce the column one to be continuous, and the column two to be a count variable, and the column three to be something else, right? So what I'll do here is coerce the geo column to be multi-class, and the little column to be multi-class, right? That's what the uh, exercise was asking. And so if you create this pipe one, it will be a sequential transform with coalesce and then coerce, right? I have a question. Yeah. So if you do the replace in the start, you will get this exact same result. So if, if you do the, re the replace transform. Yeah. Okay. You can also replace missing by something else, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be an alternative. But the advantage of uh, coalesce is that it's also changing the resulting column type. When you do replace, the column type will still be a union of missing and int. Ah, yeah, okay. The coalesce will change to be actually a column of int. Say, it, it replaces, to make sure that there's no missing value, it's actually going to change the type of the column to something more specific. I don't know if it's possible to zoom it a little bit more. Here as well? Yes, yeah. please. One more. More, one more, or it's fine? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. So that's, that should be big. So the second uh, exercise here is to do this other sequence of actions here, right? So I want to select the variables gold, uh, AG, copper, arsenic, and, and sulfur. Uh, and then I want to perform principal component analysis, which is this statist multivariate statistical transformation. I just have a question about the cores. Mm -hmm. Does it call the multi-class on every element of the, uh, of the table? Is this, uh, so you choose the columns that you want to change the scientific type, right? So, for example, convert the column geo to multi-class. It will take the column, will look at all possible categories, the classes, and it will create a categorical array with these three classes. Mm -hmm. And so if there are like many, many repetitions of class one, class two, it will just create the categorical array which stores the three classes and repeats the number of entries. Safe memory, so... Yeah. And also it encodes explicitly that this is a categorical variable so that when you do a classification problem or clustering or something, you know already that this is categorical. It behaves like a categorical variable. So in the second one, the idea is to select and perform PCA, right? And the good thing about this uh, table transform uh, submodule is that it allows you to do these very complicated transforms which are not just pixel-wise or I would say like row-by-row -row operations or column-by-column. Column. So PCA is a multivariate transform. It takes many columns at the same time. It produces many columns. It's, let's say it's a more sophisticated transform that works here in any geospatial domain. So if you have a raster or if you have a point set or if you have a mesh, it will do PCA on the features whatever you, wherever you are, right? So well, I'll do this here live as well because I know you, you are still working on this and then I'll pass again on the table to see who, who is having trouble, right? So the first action or transform here is the select transform, which is basically a fancy way of selecting features or columns, right? So if you look at the live docs, you see that there are many ways to specify columns. We call this the call spec. 
And you can say, you can pass strings as the names of the columns, symbols, regular expressions, and uh, it will understand that you want to select this column. Right? So the way I'll do here, because I know that my data set that I loaded here at the beginning, it's called raw, right? My raw data set has these columns as the first five columns. I'll just use the syntax one through five instead of typing everything, but you are also allowed to do any, anything, right? So say, give me the columns one to five, right? That's one way of specifying this uh, transform, right? But you can also do explicit lists, right? So you can say column AU followed by column AG followed by blah, blah, blah. That's another way of specifying the same transform. But for short, I'll just say one to five. Now the second transform we want to perform is PCA, and there is a PCA transform, so I'll say backslash to PCA. And if you open the PCA documentation, it's going to give you what are the options for PCA. You can say that's the maximum number of dimensions to retain, the ratio of the, the variance to retain, right? So this is a detail of the implementation, right? So the PCA transform is implemented as a sequence of two transforms. First, it computes the z-score, and then it gives the eigen analysis of this v basis, which is one specific way of projecting the, the, the PCA transform. And then it has, for example, it's equivalent to this, right? So when I'm typing PCA here, what happens behind the scenes is actually taking this transform and adding to the, to the pipeline, right? So I'll say, compute the PCA of this. I will, I will not specify any option, just PCA is this. And you see that the pipeline that was created actually is select, followed by z-score, followed by eigen analysis, right? And that's doing the, the workflow bit by bit. And after you have this pipe 2, the pipe 3 here uh, is to select the density variable, which is this whole row variable, and then compute the z-score. So I'll just do this here live as well. So I'll select the variable row with this column, right? So that's the variable. And then I will feed that selection into the z-score transform. An alternative way to write this would be just to use, I think that's the version already that's loaded, z-score of the column row. So some of these transforms, they already accept the column specification, so you can just skip the selection, right? It's the same thing, so it's going to apply the z-score transformation on the column row. And so, see, I'm building my pipeline without even talking about the data set, right? So everything is separated so that you can build it once and apply it to multiple data sets, right? And then, uh, the last one here so that we get things working, that's going to be a geospatial one, because so far, all these transforms were applied to the features, right? To the covariates of the problem, the columns. A, B, uh, mineral grades, and so on. We also have transforms that are applied to the geometries. Say, I want to standardize the coordinates to live in a box minus one to one, or I want to rotate my domain, or I want to translate my data set to somewhere else. These are geospatial. And the good thing about this pipeline is that it combines both feature transforms with geometric transforms smoothly. So you can create pipelines that combine the two and all the magic will happen behind the scenes. It will be transforming the domain, transforming the features, combining things in the, thing, in the end, right? So here I'll say standardize the coordinates of my domain. So if I look at the docs, it's always nice to see if there's options. So there's no options because standardize is, is what it does. And then I'll follow that to another transform, which is dtrend. And dtrend is a covariate transform. It's a feature transform, but it uses the coordinates. So it's feeding a polynomial to the data set to, to, to identify some trend, and then it's removing the trend from the data set, right? So I say, I have a map where the temperature is increasing in the north-south direction. I want to remove this trend. I create this D-trend transform so that it removes it out from my data set, right? So I can specify the degree of the polynomial. So I'll say degree equals one, but it's the default, right? And it creates my pipe 4 pipeline. After that, I can combine all of this, which is already done here. So you see, I created sub-pieces of my final pipeline. So I say pipe 1 followed by pipe 2, and then this operator here is this one, backslash sq, SQ cup, 
which is basically taking the result of two pipelines and concatenating horizontally. So it creates, imagine that you generate one table with one pipeline, one table with another, and they're all in the same domain. You can just concatenate the features with this, uh, back, uh, this backslash SQ cup, which is this joint union, right? So you say apply pipe one, apply pipe two, join with the pipe three followed by pipe four. And I think I missed something here because the result shouldn't be an error, right? So let's see if I missed some of the pipelines there. Let's see what I did. Pipe zero was coalesce followed by coerce. That should be okay. Multi-class, right? Then pipe two was select one through five PCA. Then pipe three was Z score. And then pipe four was STD coordinates followed by D trend. It should be okay. I don't know why we get this error. Maybe I missed something. Yeah, it's a very difficult to read error here. Let's see if I can debug like apply. D trend. There was an error in the D trend operation for some reason. Oh, I didn't specify what column to detrend, right? So it's asking to detrend all, all variables. No, it's, it should be okay with degree one. <coughs> Let's see what's the data set looking like. It's weird because I, I thought it was working with all columns. So let me just choose column one, A, 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 U here to see if it works now. It works for me. It works for you, right? What, what did I do differently? I mean, the instructor got it wrong. What is the, <laughs> what is the, what is the thing? It worked for you guys. Wait. It, you got the same? But did you run the one where you combine all the pipelines? Did you run the line where you combine? That one will automatically run. Uh -huh. Yeah, everything synced, supposedly. Uh, for some reason, I'm not getting... Oh, it's running again now. Oh, I think it was actually stuck. My Pluto was outdated. I think it should be... No, it's still not running for me. It's, it has to do with the categorical array. So let me just see if I did the... I specify the name of the columns. Maybe I have a typo. Geo multi-class and Lito multi-class. Yeah, I don't know why. It's not doing the thing. It's just hard to keep up with everything yeah, if it, if it works for you guys, I don't know why it's not here. I, I think I have something like super basic that I'm not seeing. But it should work fine for you, right? I don't know what's happening for me. It's trying to use categorical values where I shouldn't be using. Uh, yeah, so nice that it works for you guys. So this was just to show that you can easily construct um, pipelines, right? So you can take these small transforms and build very complicated pipelines uh, at the end. So before we go to the next section, I will just show these examples here. So these are other examples of pipelines that can be used. So for example, take my data set and feed into these two transforms, right? The first one, you convert the liptology column to a multi-class. And then after it's multi-class, you do one hot transformation to break this liptology column into four columns, as you see here, where each column is a binary of zeros and ones. So for example, say you have a categorical variables that you want to break into multiple maps of zeros and ones. That's called the one hot transform. It's very common in machine learning when you're doing neural net stuff. You break the categories into maps of zeros and ones and you train the net on these more low level zeros and ones, uh, which are indicator maps, right? Uh, notice one thing that I would like to emphasize here at the session is that these are very, let's say, uh, handcrafted operations because they are they know the geospatial domain behind the scenes so they avoid creating copies of geometry so it always tries to make views and subsets of the original data set to avoid copies right so if you say for example filter my data set where the gold is above 0.5 and the copper is above 0 and if you ask for the domain of this new geospatial data set it's going to be a view right so it's just filtering the rows finding the indices where these things hold where this future is valid, and then you do a view. There are other operations like sampling as well. So sampling is also just taking subsets of the original data set, so it's also going to be a view. And you can do all sorts of things. One of the very important, let's say, features of this uh, pipeline approach here is that they are revertible. 
meaning that if you create a pipeline, you can undo all these operations in sequence to your final result. So for example, this is very common when you need to do statistical modeling on Gaussian or normal distributions, and your distribution is not Gaussian. You do a pipeline to get to ideal state, so you transform everything to Gaussian, you standardize the coordinates, you do everything there, perform your modeling, and then you want to come back to the original space, so you undo the operations, the, the full pipeline. And that's very easy to do because you can just say, create my pipeline P, and then you use this other operation here. So it's instead of applying it as a function, you say, apply my pipeline to the data, and it creates the new data set, which is the same thing as applying it as a function, but it also gives you this cache variable, which is a generic way of saying, this is all the information I need to undo everything, right? And so this cache variable here is complicated as it gets. If your pipeline is complicated, this cache will be super complicated. But it doesn't matter. It's just a variable that you store somewhere, and then you can revert later. So you can revert your pipeline with your new data using the cache, and then it gets back to the original feature space. That's super important for statistical modeling, because some models like require you to be between minus one and one or Gaussian distributions, and so you need to map there, work, and come back uh, with easy, right? So before we jump to the final section of the, this first notebook, I'll just go over the table again to see if there's any issues or anything that I can help. In the documentation, there's no PCA or some of the higher level functions that combine, for example, C score and. Interesting. So it's not showing up in the GeoStats docs, you mean? No, it's not. Yeah. So this, as you see the docs there, they show the code that generates the exact uh, set of transforms because they come, some of them come from the package table transforms.jl, right? So if I click uh -huh. here and I open the. Transform. It comes up in the it comes up in, in the Pluto documentation, but in the documentation like Oh yeah, I know why. I know why. There. It's because the PCA as I showed in the docs is just a shortcut for uh, eigen analysis, right? Z score followed by eigen analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think the way that we print this hierarchy here with abstract trees, it's not taking the aliases, right? It's just showing the eigen analysis here mm -hmm. and the Z score separately. I see. Yeah. So, As in, but some people, i.e. me, would not know that. Yeah, yeah, so the idea is that these transforms come from this package here, table transforms. Mm -hmm. right? So if you go to table transforms docs, there will be like the full list of, okay. the, of the transforms. There are the feature transforms. Mm -hmm. So table transforms, it stores the, the, the transforms that are only on the features, right, on the feature space, the columns that represent variables. Mm -hmm. And you can have the full list of transforms in this documentation. You okay. see that the PCA should show up somewhere here. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, that one does. And if it's not on this table transforms, it means that it's somewhere else in the stack, probably on meshes, because it's a geometric transform, mm -hmm. or parts of it are also in geostat space, which takes these two words and combines with specializations, right? Okay. So there are some specializations we need to do to avoid uh, copying geometries and all these things that happen in other packages, but uh, the idea is that geometric transforms lives in meshes, mm -hmm. feature transforms lives in table transforms, and sometimes you need to do some specific things to dispatch them together. Mm -hmm. And so let me go back again to the round table to see if there's anything. And then we will go to this last session, which I think is super powerful too for data science, which is one of the things. Did you manage to? No, still running. Oh, seems. Wow. All of them. I'm impressed because I was telling people, like, I have yeah. a tablet, right? Again, it's yes. working. It's, yeah. Uh, it's should, sure. be, should be faster in yours than in mine. Yeah, I don't yeah, know why. Like the is it do it's Docker is still running? Or maybe no, if you close all the apps that are, like, consuming your memory or something like that? I guess so. I should just restart this machine. Yeah, I don't know yeah. how many apps are like if it's super heavy yeah. on the other apps, maybe it's yeah, uh, yeah it was yeah. stalling stuff there. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. yeah. well, I just I just want because in type one what we did was we converted geo to little domotic geo and little domotic class, but in type two what we did was we didn't select that those two classes. So in the end in the data that uh, 
in the game in the resultant in the resultant data that you find, it doesn't include uh, geo and uh, geo and little in part of, in that part of the analysis. So is yeah. part is that part of part one actually necessary? No, yeah, I created like a dummy example. Okay, yeah, yeah, just combining things. But yeah, mm -hmm. if, if you expect to see the geo and litho there, yeah, I didn't add. But you can actually take the final pipeline and put a SQ cup, follow up with a selection of geo and litho, and it should add the columns back again, right? I see. But yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's it basically like the example is not like it's looking like it's discarding parts of the yeah, pipeline. Yeah. Right? yeah, it's just like an example. Yeah. So if you launch Pluto there, like what happens? And Docker is really, I don't know, anyone got into Docker? Just asking. <coughs> yeah, it takes a long, long time. Yeah, Docker is just, yeah, you can try, but I think uh, my impression that many people switch to just installing Julia locally, mm -hmm. but if you select the yeah. add down here, yeah. you can just, yeah. and then press oh, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just start, should be and then the Docker one, you press enter. And I think Pluto has this bug that you click on open and it just erases oh, the okay. path. <laughs> <laughs> Great. It's weird, yeah. On Windows only, by the way. In Linux it works, if you press open it works. You got the install, right? So you say using uh, space pkg with capital P, yeah, and then pkg dot add, add, open parenthesis, and then Pluto, double quotes Pluto, double quotes Pluto. And then you install Pluto, and then you can say using Pluto, Pluto.run. If you launch Pluto locally instead of in the Docker. Using Pluto. Yeah. For me, I'm very explicit. Yeah. But it's not just plot. It's kind of like the same here. Yeah. And then you know what you can do? Yeah, maybe you got some features for incorrect. Why? It's. Yeah, it takes a long time to load the pack of code and compile it. Yeah, that's pretty good. It's what we write this year. Yeah, yeah. when it's done, yeah. it's still in the very top. It's not everything to pass. Yeah, of course. It's in Russian. I think it's close. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
the groups into new variables. So I'll say, give me the mean value of gold in groups and the standard deviation of gold in these groups. So it creates this new geospatial data set where you have the category geo here. There are one, two types of geology. And inside of each geology, it computed the mean value of gold and the standard deviation of gold for geology C1 and the mean and the standard deviation for geology C2. And notice the fancy part here. The geometries became multi-boxes, which means it combined many boxes that are completely random in space, let's say they're not connected topologically, and created this new geometry called multi-box, which just interprets all these boxes as one thing. And this is very nice because now you can do more geometric processing with this guy. So for example, if I want to compute the volume of the geology C1, I can just say the, the volume of this geometry, which is very non-trivial, right? So one of the nice things about this is that these are all composable. So let's say, what, what is happening behind the scenes? So this chain macro comes from the data frames macros idea. I think it was originally written in the, I, I think it's in the change.jl package, and we just re-export it here. And it just allows you to concatenate expressions uh, without having to repeat the data set all the time. So I'm saying, pass this data set to a sequence of operations. But what is happening behind the scenes is that we are calling one by one. So I say, group by the data set according to the geo column. It creates a geospatial partition, which is, again, lazy, right? So it says there's a view of the data set with 1,700 uh, boxes, and there is another view with 2,000. Uh, boxes, which are this geology 1 and geology 2 types. After it has these groups, which have their boxes associated, you can perform the transform on the groups, right? So I say, combine these groups and create these new columns, the mean of the column AU and the standard deviation of the column AU. And so that's what's happening behind the scenes, but it's happening in a way that hides from you all this complexity of grouping geometries doing more of the geometric processing behind the scenes and letting you concentrate on your data science pipeline, right? So here, for example, is this uh, exercise where we want to compute, let's say, the total mass of gold that will be mined, let's say, from each lithology. And we want to implement this as this sequence here, right? So I'm giving you the recipe on how to compute this uh, number, right? And uh, I'll just give you maybe one minute to try this out. I don't know if it's enough. Or maybe I should actually, for the sake of time, just do this and then we can go for questions. I think it's better. So what's the idea here? We, want, we posed our question, right? So the question was, what is the total mass of gold that will be mined from each type of lithology? So imagine that you have your satellite image or your coral reef model or volcano model. We want to pose questions like this. What's the mean value of this inside of each type of rock, whatever? To answer this, we'll probably use one of these three macros here. So I would, I would do it here. So first, <coughs> I'll chain my blocks to start doing things. Right? So if I do just this, I think it's not going to do anything because it's just chaining this data set into nothing. So it's just returning the original data set. Right? So the first operation is group by. I want to group my geospatial data set into different lithologies, right? So I'll say group by by lithology, which is the column of lithologies. So you see it created a partition with four subsets. So there is four sets of boxes that are in space which have different lithology. Now I want to transform to compute the mass of gold because this variable AU is called a grade, it's kind of a percentage of volume. And so to get mass, you have to multiply the density times the percentage times the volume of the block, right? And now it's where it gets interesting because you can say transform, sorry here, transform, and I will create this new variable. I will call it mass maybe, a yeah, mass. That's my new column. And my column will be this multiplication, right? So I have a column of density, which is called row, I'll just say double uh, column row, times the column of percentage of gold or gold uh, grade, right? So say column AU times the volume of the block. 
And that's where the geometric processing enters, right? So say the volume of the geometry column. And that's going to be the magic of uh, this geospatial split apply combined because it will understand that the special word geometry refers to the boxes. It will call the volume function from the meshes.jl package, compute volumes of boxes and exahedrons, whatever, and then return back a geospatial data set with everything as expected, right? So here I'm creating this new column called mass. And it shouldn't change the output because it's still a partition, right? Uh, so I'm not seeing, if you want to see the result, you can actually hide the group by, right? So that it can just transforms and creates a new column. But to get the final result, you see, you have to combine these masses into the total mass, right? Because you have still the four groups. So I'll just take this new column of mass that's inside of each group, and I'll combine into a new column, I'll call it mass again, which is just the sum of the mass. And you see that magically, uh, after some time, it gets to this where you have, for each lithology, a total mass of gold. And this lithology is represented by a multi-box of 2,000 geometries that are of type box. So here, you are actually associating features to groups of geometries, which is super nice. And most nice yet is that you can visualize this as before. So this, I'll show here, let's say, the, the final answer is the total mass, right? So I can say the mass is the sum of the minus mass. And you should get your answer right. And then you can actually view with our viewer, right? So this is a 3D data set where the geometries are multi-box. And it will show here um, uh, as easy as if it was a 2D data set and the geometries that are multi-boxes, they will just show as different colors because these multi-boxes are associated with different values of mass, right? And that's going to take some time because it's running on my tablet, but it should show in a few seconds, hopefully. And in order to get the same visualization, you, you need to run the notebook uh, geodatascience.jl instead of geodatascience-docker, which is the one that's done with Maki. Can you scroll up again? Can I just see this? What is it? Can you scroll up a bit? Yeah. And yeah, and as you can see, uh, did you copy here already? That's fine. Yeah, Thank you. I will come back later. So if you see here, I just asked to view this geospatial data set, and it's a 3D volume where each column here is a subgroup, right? So this is actually not trivial to, to visualize, right? Because we have multi boxes or any multi-geometry from matches will work. It will figure out that all this geometry should plot it in one color. The other geometries here from the other subgroup should be plotted in the other column. But this is done behind the scenes, like hidden from you, right? So that's the idea. At some point, we want to be able to do geospatial split apply combine and just view directly in space what the results are. Here are just some additional resources. So if you want to uh, check this in more detail, right, you go to the Geostats documentation. It's, we try to update the, the docs every now and then. Okay. And there are some other related packages like geotables, emmet.jl, and CDS API that allow you to get data into Julia uh, more easily. Uh, here at the end is just a demonstration where you can uh, load a shape file, let's say, from uh, a file on disk. And the geotables package is just a package that uses some of those packages that were presented this morning, like shapefiles.jl, geos.json, and wraps them up into a single load function that recognizes the file extension and just reports the data set with geometries that are meshes geometries, right? So it just loads the data, converts the geometries to meshes, and shows us the geospatial data set to do whatever you need, right? And the same here, the interaction of the 2D plot, right? So you can zoom in and zoom out choose the variables that are available in this data set to see. And that's the idea. There are some things that are still working, uh, being developed, right? So uh, it takes some time to get this viewer fully uh, smooth, but it's, that's the idea. And here I think I'll stop for a short uh, break and questions. And so we, we jump to the second notebook. So let's see. More 10 minutes of questions there.
And if you want to try the second one, I think it's going to take even more time to load, so just do it right now here while... <laughs> It's, it's here in the break, so go all the way up to the top, click on the Pluto icon. You can cancel the Geodata Science one, which was running. And then we go to the second one, which is called Geostats Learn. This one is going to be taking more time to load, and so it's a good idea to start it up. What is it? Is it supposed to be 45 plus 15 plus 45? It's like two hours to go. Yeah, so, yeah. so it's like 14 to 15 was one, and then 15 to 55. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The cruise so it's 15 45 already? Yeah, so. Uh, wow. After yeah, I didn't realize. Yeah. 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 more time to finish. Yeah. 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 Oh, so just pass through very quickly the other one if it's time. 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah. So, yeah. so guys, actually I think I miscalculated the time of the, the session, right? So I think I'll just go skim quickly the second one and you can run it locally later, but I, we only have 10 minutes left, so <laughs> that's not going to be enough, but see. The idea of the second one here is just to show some of the uh, machine learning challenges with geospatial data, right? So. For some of you who already follow, followed some of the JuliaCom events in the past, I think some of this material is already known. But for you who are seeing for the first time, like the idea is that if you try to do machine learning with geospatial data normally, you encounter many difficulties, right? So this machine learning theory and methods and, and tools that were created for table types which are not necessarily under the same assumptions of geospatial data sets, for example, your samples are not IID, your samples are associated with specific volumes, or we call support, uh, and there are many challenges, for example, data set shift, right? So if you train your, your model in one place and apply in another place, things just don't work because the distributions are different, right? So this notebook here that you have access to, to read more carefully later, just goes over some of these challenges, right? I don't know if it's gonna be enough time to see all the examples running here, but um, the idea is that there are challenges with both, let's say, classification, regression, or any of these traditional machine learning uh, workflows. And what we propose here is that there are ways of formulating the problem uh, differently that take into account the fact that these data have domain associated with them and that the samples are georeferenced, right? And in this notebook here, which I don't think will be loaded in time, it shows like what can happen if you don't take that into account. But it's basically showing that if you run a classification model on a satellite image, for example, and you try to make uh, an estimation of the error of the model in another different area, your estimates of error will be super optimistic. You'll show like, oh, you have, I don't know, 10% error. And then when you actually deploy the model in the field, you get like 20% error or more. And that's happening for a very good reason. And this notebook explains a bit of this uh, literature and shows that there are ways of estimating this error that don't fall into this, uh, the problems, right? So there are some literatures and reference we can go over over the week uh, together if you have interest in that. But the idea is that the, the Geostats framework integrates with a bunch of existing uh, stacks like MLJ in Julia, which has, is the default, let's say, stack for machine learning. And it does some layers of uh, abstraction to, let's say, avoid some of these issues, right? So there's still things wor being worked on, but there are, uh, this is the code, how it looks like more or less. So you, you define, for example, that you want to make a classification based on some bands of a satellite and you want to predict the crop variable, you define your learning problem where you have a geospatial data set as the source, a geospatial data set as the target, and you have your learning task, T. You load a model, let's say that's traditional, let's say a decision tree classifier or something, and you wrap this model into a solver. We call this solver here the, the, the naive pointwise learn solver, right? 
you can then create what we call these validation procedures like block validation, leave ball out, these are specific to geospatial data sets to estimate an, a value for this error that's more, let's say, close to the actual error you get from the model, right? There are references that you can follow here, but I don't think, let's see here how the visualizations are going. So this here is the data set. You have like a place of the image which has labels and you want to predict the crop type in the other part here. And all these plots are interactive after the notebook are loaded, right? So you can zoom in and zoom out to see more. And at the end here, I also show, uh, for example, how clustering uh, also can be very problematic if you don't take into account your spatial coordinates, right? So you, you compare, for example, k-means with something more geospatial, and you have more control of the final clusters you get if you use this geospatial clustering methods instead. There is a paper, which is the paper we published uh, on this matter, right? So we introduced this geostatistical learning uh, framework and, and formulation that you can read in more detail. It's more mathy, uh, but it's uh, available op open access. And here's an example that I would like to actually see, but I don't think we'll have time, but it's actually showing how you can load a 3D mesh of a building. It's like a 3D model where you can train a model in a specific part of the building and predict uh, the variable you want in another part of the building. So it's, it's very uh, advanced in the sense that you can split, apply, combine pieces of the building, which is very cool. So you get these complicated geometries like hexahedrons, triangles, whatever. You can split these geometries, transform and combine, and things will still work as if they were an image or a point set. It's very non-trivial to get this working. But it's going to take a lot to compile. So I'll just finish here, wrap up, and feel free to load the notebook later, and then we can check. So I think I'll, with that, I'll close the session in, in the sake of time. Right, John? We don't have much. More. Yeah, unfortunately not, but thank you very much, it was very interesting, and I highly recommend that you check this uh, second notebook, because it's, uh, it's, first it has very interesting stuff, it's very well explained as well, and it has all the references, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's, uh, it's a super job. So thank you very much. Um, if you are, uh, if you are uh, attending remotely, this is closes the day. Uh, for the group who are here, now we have coffee break downstairs, and then we have the hackathon at the quarter past four, for one hour. But the, the, the hackathon uh, is not um, is not uh, streamed, so uh, you can join us tomorrow if you are online. Uh, you can join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. again. Thank you. Sure. So the coffee break will be where we head in the morning. And then the second session is on the Oh, okay, the Yeah, like outside. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, outside, outside. So, 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 So you see here, like, it's going to the end. So this is the 3D model. Yeah. Oh, this is Wait there. This is yeah. like cold and hidden just for the sake of, like, not going to the other Oh, yeah. This one. Oh, yeah. 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 It's like an error that's not causing any. Oh, yeah, okay. so mark, this is a Bluetooth thing, so when you say markdown stream, it creates in the markdown cell. Okay. It's like it creates text that's readable, but it's just a stream.
prefix becomes and that's the way Google has different in Jupyter where you have to create a cell of type markdown. This is just a normal cell of the markdown string. Hopefully you can solve something more than this. It's such a challenge, right, to get things working. Yeah, I think Pluto's is really nice. Yeah, it's also like sometimes I'm worried that it's also complicated that it's just because it's complicated in all the initializations and stuff that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. That's why I created the dash docker one to avoid the visualizations. It's more like a low level. Because this one, as you see, it's still running again. There are some cool visualizations down there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the boxes that update, right? So this guy kind of can inspire the yeah. So here's like the, the beauty, like so if you zoom in, it's like a very 